So, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sanjeev Mota from BNK Securities. Uh, on behalf of BNK, I welcome all of you to another session of our Ideation Stroke Thought Leadership Series. Uh, in today's fireside chat, we have Mr. Samir Kothari. Uh, Samir is the managing director at Hindustan Foods. Uh, Samir is uh, a chartered accountant and has done an MBA from Cornell. And Samir, welcome to this fireside chat. We are looking forward to this discussion on contract manufacturing and what you know, Sun Foods is up to. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sanjeev and Pareen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, the way, uh, if it's okay with you, Sanjeev and Pareen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about contract manufacturing, especially FMCG contract manufacturing for a few minutes. Um, I think a lot of people are not familiar with the industry. Uh, and, and, and frankly, because they're not familiar with the industry, they don't know what we do, uh, which is Hindustan Foods. Uh, so I thought instead of introducing uh, us directly, uh, I'll spend a few minutes uh, explaining what FMCT contract manufacturing is, uh, which will be an interesting uh, segue into what Hindustan Foods does. Sure. That'll be so, great. Uh, what do you? Okay. Yeah. So good. So, uh, so while, you know, contract manufacturing as an industry, uh, is, is something which a lot of people are becoming familiar with more recently uh, because of more uh, famous names like Dixon, Amber, etc. Uh, the contract manufacturing of FMCG is not something which people look at in the same light or even think about it uh, when they're thinking about contract manufacturing. It's generally restricted to electronics. It's restricted to uh, uh, all the PLI schemes. Um, it's interestingly also restricted to pharmaceuticals. And I just want to uh, explain in a few minutes uh, to you and to your listeners as to why that is so, right? Uh, so the contract manufacturing, uh, uh, FMCG contract manufacturing in India uh, is a very old industry, right? It's been around for a long time. Uh, it's, it's been uh, there since the 80s. Uh, it's, it, was, it started off uh, because of regulatory framework. Uh, so you would remember that, at least you and I will remember, uh, Sanjeev, uh, if not the younger audience of yours, uh, that in the late 80s, we were more of a socialist uh, kind of an economy. Uh, and a lot of uh, the FMCG products uh, were looked upon as a luxury. So what the government did is uh, they tried to bring in uh, some reservations uh, they said that certain FMCG products can be manufactured only by the small scale industry. Uh, the idea was to make it more democratic. Uh, and the second thing that they did, of course, was uh, they taxed the hell out of FMCG products, right? Uh, what this led to is a very, very small scale contract manufacturers. Uh, if you remember, something like toothpaste uh, was actually reserved for uh, SSIs, uh, small scale industries. So which means if you wanted to manufacture or market a toothpaste in the 80s, uh, you had to tie up with a small scale industry uh, to manufacture your product. What this led to is uh, very, very small factories, obviously, uh, they had to be SSIs. And in the late 80s, it will come as a surprise to you, uh, the, the turnover and the investment was uh, less than 5 lakhs of rupees. Uh, the total investment that you could make uh, to qualify as an SSI was just about 5 lakhs, right? Uh, a lot of mom and pop stores came up. What mom and pop stores, what I mean is, it was a very unorganized industry. Uh, generally, the brand owners helped set up the facility. Uh, so most of the contract manufacturers were either friends or family or ex-employees of uh, the marketing FMCT companies. Small factories, uh, mom and pop stores, uh, not professionally managed, and because of the limitations, uh, there was no uh, capex. Uh, so which means most of the operations were manual, lot of people, uh, no machinery, no automation. The second phase uh, which started in this is uh, uh, when the government announced area-based reservations, right? Um, so there were exemptions announced uh, to begin with in Kutch, then in Himachal, Uttarachal, then in uh, the Northeast, uh, and then of course in uh, Jammu as well. Now, you have to remember that even in, in as early as uh, uh, the late 1900s and the early 2000s, uh, FMCG products were continued to be uh, subjected to a very, very high excise duty. And as a result, 
uh, tax exemptions were very, very critical uh, for people uh, to decide their manufacturing strategy. So a lot of the FMCG companies uh, set up factories in these areas. They were larger than the first phase. They were larger than SSI uh, because you had a tax exemption for five years. You knew that you were going to be in that location for five years so you could afford to invest in capex and better infrastructure. However, uh, this tax exemption was also combined with a direct tax arbitrage. So as a result, uh, there was an incentive for the FMCG companies to set up their own factories. And most of the brand owners set up very, very large facilities uh, in Uttaranchal, in Himachal, in Kutch, uh, and of course in Northeast and Jammu. So that, according to me, uh, was the second phase as far as the FMCG uh, industry is concerned. Uh, now, this is the present, right? And what I call the phase three. Uh, things have changed uh, very interestingly. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why uh, uh, we have done so well as well. Uh, one of the biggest change has been the introduction of GST, right? Uh, GST has made all the tax arbitrages uh, redundant. So there's no longer an advantage in terms of locating your factory in, in a particular area. Uh, and as a result, manufacturing decisions or your manufacturing footprint is now decided based on either where your customer is or based on where you can source your raw materials from. Or if you're looking at an integrated factory, you would look at the mobility uh, and transportation infrastructure of that particular location. Uh, so GST has effectively made India as one country, one market, right? Uh, you are able to produce a product, uh, let's say in Telangana, uh, where I am today, uh, and, and ship it to Andhra Pradesh uh, without having to pay the penalty of a CST tax, the central sales tax, uh, as earlier. So this has allowed the FMCG companies uh, to look at their manufacturing footprint and decide the locations uh, based on a market, based on raw material availability. Uh, the third thing which is happening presently, of course, is, and, and I know that uh, you've uh, hosted uh, Mr. Harish Chawla earlier, who's spoken about this uh, uh, quite a bit, uh, is that e-commerce is, is changing the way uh, distribution is, is, is happening in the country. There was a time when uh, the biggest moat or the biggest advantage that an FMCG company had uh, was that of its distribution network. So if you were present in, let's say, 300,000 stores, uh, any new brand who came in uh, could not effectively compete with you uh, because there's no way that you could get into 300,000 stores right away. However, the Amazons and the Flipkarts and uh, the organized retailers like Dmart and Geomart uh, have changed that completely. Because if you're a new brand today, uh, you're able to get onto an Amazon, get onto a Flipkart, and suddenly a person in a small town in, in let's say, UP or Bihar is able to get access to your product uh, thanks to e-commerce. Uh, similarly, you sign a deal with, let's say, Dmart or with Geomart, and you are in all their stores. Uh, so you have to deal with one company, uh, but suddenly you have multiple doors open for you uh, as opposed to the traditional model of going and signing up with distributors in each state or in each region uh, and then going to each uh, uh, retail store. So what this has done is uh, it has changed the way FMCG uh, is uh, the industry is working. Uh, and for that, I'm going to take a couple of minutes of yours uh, just to explain what the FMCG value chain is, right? Uh, now, most of us know that, uh, uh, and, and most of us know the bigger players, right? Uh, that the reason why a Unilever or uh, a Dabur or a Marico or, or a Reckitt Benkiza uh, commands the kind of premium it does both in the market as well as in the stock market is because in the FMCG value chain, uh, they command or they, they have the maximum amount of value addition, uh, which is because of the brand that they own. So this is a very typical uh, uh, breakdown of an FMCG product. Uh, if as a consumer, you're buying a product at let's say 100 rupees, 
uh, the manufacturing cost of that product is one fourth or one fifth of the uh, uh, of the product, right? Uh, so it could be around twenty five or twenty rupees uh, as far as uh, the product is concerned. You have the brand owner who takes the risk of launching the brand, who takes the pain of advertising and educating the consumer, and as a result, he commands the maximum amount of value in that value chain. You have the distributor and the retailer who take the onus of providing that product to the, to the customer. Uh, they take the onus of moving it across geographies, and as a result, uh, they command a certain premium as well. However, if you look at the manufacturing margin, uh, that's quite low. Uh, if, you, if you look at, at uh, uh, this particular example, uh, you're talking of 20 rupees as the cost of raw material and packing material, uh, and you're looking at a manufacturing cost of just about five rupees, uh, which when you look at the entire manufacturing value chain, if you're looking at 100 rupees, uh, five rupees is, is just about 5% of it. And as a result, you have to understand that manufacturing decisions uh, are going to be based on factors other than cost. Uh, and that's a very important uh, uh, takeaway, which I want you to, uh, and you and your listeners to understand that as compared to the earlier tax arbitrage regime, uh, now people will take decisions based on a lot of other factors than just the manufacturing costs. We talked about this, uh, about how modern trade and e-commerce have transformed the distribution and supply chain, how they have led to an increase in terms of the number of brands, etc. Uh, and, and I'll talk about how that's going to affect uh, our, our contract manufacturing industry. A lot of these new D2C brands that you keep reading about in newspapers, uh, I don't see them investing in manufacturing. Uh, so which means they will end up getting more of their products uh, manufactured from contract manufacturers and that's one of the factors uh, which is leading to the growth in the contract manufacturing industry. The one thing, uh, the one more thing which has happened is contract manufacturing as an industry uh, is beginning to get some kind of recognition. Uh, the Make in India, uh, 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 the plank of the government trying to encourage manufacturing in India, uh, the success stories of an Amber and a Dixon, uh, and more importantly, even globally, uh, a name like Foxtron. Uh, uh, nobody knew that Foxtron is the manufacturer of Apple phones, uh, but they've become so large uh, that today a lot of people who follow the industry know that Foxtron is uh, the go-to person when it comes to manufacturing of phones, etc. Uh, so contract manufacturing as an industry is beginning to get some kind of visibility. Because of this visibility, uh, Contract manufacturers are able to access funds, uh, and as a result, they are able to invest much larger sums of money in their factories, uh, which they couldn't do that earlier. So, uh, where do I see this going? Uh, what I see going ahead is for the next three to five years, you will see a complete shift in the manufacturing footprint uh, of the larger brand owners. Uh, you will see a lot more factories coming up. Uh, you will see a lot more uh, decentralized manufacturing happening. Post that, I see that once manufacturing of FMCG products in the country has achieved some kind of scale, uh, it's, it's an easy leap from there, uh, to, uh, from catering to domestic demand to catering to exports. Uh, you know that the pharmaceutical outsourcing and the contract manufacturing uh, business and industry has done tremendously well for India. Uh, unfortunately, the FMCG contract manufacturing industry has not. Uh, I think it's a matter of time uh, that FMCG contract manufacturing becomes large enough uh, for us to be able to start competing with uh, the Far Eastern countries, including China, uh, in terms of supplying FMCG products to the West, which includes the US and Europe. So. Uh, I think uh, contract manufacturing will uh, grow substantially because of the impetus uh, as far as Make in India is concerned, because of the impetus of the China plus one strategy is concerned. Uh, and overall, uh, I just want to take uh, another few minutes to explain to you what we think is the total addressable market as far as FMCG contract manufacturing is concerned. If you look at the FMCG uh, uh, market size, uh, uh, 
estimates are uh, that in the Indian market is around uh, 800,000 crores. FNCT, of course, is the fourth largest sector in the country. Uh, if you remember the value chain uh, 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 slide which we presented earlier, uh, one fourth or one fifth of the value of the FMCG products is the manufacturing cost. Uh, this means that the total manufacturing pie, as far as the FMCG industry is concerned, is between 100,000 crores to 150,000 crores. Now, uh, that's the total manufacturing pie. Uh, FMCG and consumption in India, uh, we all expect to keep growing. I know that the last couple of quarters have been affected because of COVID, etc. cetera. Uh, but assuming that we come back to our normal uh, growth rates, uh, we are expecting between five to 8% as volume growth. Uh, and if that volume growth uh, uh, translates, uh, you, can, you can very well extrapolate where this figure of 100,000 crores will go in the next five to 10 years. So the total addressable market is, is, is very large. Uh, the question then comes to uh, how much of this uh, market uh, will be uh, in-source versus outsourced. In, uh, so I have a small framework and I, I don't know how much time you want me to spend on it uh, about what exactly happens uh, when a contract manufacturing uh, a company or an FMCG company decides uh, whether that this, this particular product should be outsourced or not. Uh, and this will also give you an idea about uh, what we at Hindustan Foods uh, do. So the macro framework that every uh, contract, man that every brand owner uh, goes through is, uh, it needs to understand where the product is in terms of its life cycle. Uh, and then decide whether it is something that can be outsourced or it should be insourced. We have three business models, uh, and I'm just going to try and correlate that with the product life cycle as far as FMCG products are concerned. Uh, we have a model, uh, and when I say we, I mean uh, the contract manufacturing industry in general and HFL Hindustan Foods in particular. Uh, we have a model where we set up large factories uh, which are built to suit. Uh, which means these factories are set up uh, with a long-term contract to manufacture a particular product. Uh, we sign a contract with a particular brand saying that we will manufacture so many tons or so many kilos or so many kale of the product for the next five or ten years. Now, uh, if you look at the uh, life cycle of the product, obviously this model is not suitable for new products uh, uh, if the brand owner is not able to forecast how the product is going to shape up in the next few years, uh, they cannot afford to take the risk of signing into a contract for the next five or 10 years. However, if it's a mature product, if it's a product which has been around for a while and the brand owner has got clear visibility uh, that this is how the product is going to be for the next five or 10 years, uh, this model is extremely suitable for them. What it does is uh, it guarantees a particular capacity for them it allows them to leverage the cost benefit between a contract manufacturer and a brand owner, uh, but it also gives them the same amount of reliability uh, that they would get if they were setting up their own factory, right? So this model is generally for brands uh, which are far more stable and mature. Then you have products which are newly introduced, uh, you have products which have seasonal demand, you have products uh, which are required for promotions, etc. And there's another business model which is called the shared manufacturing facility. Uh, the big point about shared manufacturing facility is that you might have a situation where competing brands are made in the same facility. And uh, this as a layman uh, sounds very counterintuitive. Uh, but when you look at the back end of the process, you'd be surprised to know that there would be factories which, let's say, can manufacture TVs for Chroma, they can manufacture it for Sony, and they can manufacture it for Samsung as well. Uh, I, of course, am not taking any examples from my industry uh, for obvious reasons, uh, but the principle remains the same, uh, that you could have a facility uh, where competing brands are made the same facility. The idea is, uh, if it's a new product introduction, the brand owner is not sure about uh, uh, how uh, the market is going to shape up. 
they don't want to take a risk in terms of uh, setting up their own factory. Uh, they can come to somebody like us uh, and make use of our existing capacities. Uh, let's say there's a product like a beverage, uh, which has a seasonal demand, uh, which means during the summer season, uh, the demand suddenly shoots up. You don't want to invest in capacities which can meet that peak demand throughout the year because in the rest of the time of the year, the demand is not as much. So you come to a manufacturer like us uh, and for that extra demand, uh, you come to somebody like us, right? Uh, let's say you have a promotion. Uh, you have the big day that Mr. Biani popularized. You have a seasonal, uh, uh, you, have, you do a promotion because of, of let's say, uh, some kind of schemes, etc. You need additional capacities. Uh, you obviously, it's a temporary requirement. You don't want to invest in capacity. Uh, you come to somebody like us. The third and the last business model is a new model for us, uh, Sanjeev. Uh, this is private labels. Uh, because of the growing uh, D2C brands, right? And because of the growing organized retail, uh, we've started this just about a couple of years ago. Uh, and here, what we are doing is uh, we are giving a full solution. Uh, we are basically developing the product. Uh, we are doing the packaging development and only uh, the brand owner only has to come and uh, give us the artwork and we can make a product for you. What this does is uh, that uh, your time to market is reduced substantially. And one example of this was during COVID, especially during the first wave. Uh, when suddenly hand wash and hand sanitizers were required by everyone, uh, we were able to extend uh, the uh, uh, brands for a bunch of companies who were not in hand wash or hand sanitizer categories, uh, but we were able to launch their products within a, a month, month and a half uh, of us signing up with them uh, for a brand which was never in the hand wash or hand sanitizer category. Uh, in addition to that, a lot of B2C brands, uh, direct to consumer brands, uh, are, are uh, happy to look at this kind of a model where they don't have to invest in R&D, they don't have to invest uh, uh, in uh, doing their own research, they don't have to invest in doing their own packaging development and we are able to help uh, them with it. So, uh, given that this is what is required, given that out of the 100,000 crores that we talked about, now you've decided that let's outsource 25% of it uh, which then gives you uh, 25,000 crores as the uh, the addressable market. Uh, the question is, uh, who's going to be benefiting or who's going to get a bigger wallet share of this 25,000 crores? And there, what we are seeing is uh, brand owners, FMCG companies are beginning to look at professional contract manufacturers. Uh, they are looking at people who can who can execute projects. Uh, like I said earlier, the investments in factories have risen substantially. It's not uncommon now to invest uh, uh, a couple of hundred crores in one location uh, in terms of manufacturing capacity. So you need a contract manufacturer who's able to do that kind of project execution. You need someone who's able to work across the country, right? Uh, uh, you have decentralized manufacturing. You need a manufacturing location. Let's say in, in UP, you need one in Hyderabad, you need one in, in the West, in Nasik, you need one in the East, in Katak. Uh, you want somebody whom you can work with across the country. You have the option of developing smaller guys across the country, uh, but you would much rather work with, with lesser number of people who can work uh, uh, in multiple locations. One very important part is dependability. Uh, again, to take an example of an industry which is not FMCG, uh, we all have seen uh, what happened with uh, Winstron uh, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the mess they had in their uh, Bangalore uh, campus. Uh, you need a contract. So one of the, that's, that's the worst nightmare uh, that, a, that a contract manufacturer can have. Uh, uh, because as a contract manufacturer, what we bring to the table is uh, our execution skills. Uh, we bring to the table our dependability uh, and we bring to our table the ability to shield the brand from any kind of issues which arise as far as manufacturing is concerned. Uh, so you saw how quickly Apple reacted uh, and they suspended Winstron for some time. They wanted to safeguard their brand name from any kind of mess that was happening at the contract manufacturer's level. 
And like I said, uh, that's that's the biggest nightmare uh, that a contract manufacturer can have. So dependability is very, very critical. Uh, you want a contract manufacturer, you want a partner whom you know will not end up uh, putting your brand value and your brand in a soup. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, the press that Nike got uh, when uh, the episode in Bangladesh happened. Uh, and you, uh, you, you want to ensure that your brand is protected uh, from any kind of excesses or any kind of uh, corporate governance lapses that happen at your contract manufacturer's end. So it's very critical that you have a large dependable business partner as a contract manufacturer. And uh, you, can't, you can't shy away from cost. Uh, obviously, uh, the choice of contract manufacturer comes down to uh, the ability to provide uh, the lowest cost. Uh, and as a result, and, 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 and the reason I put this up is just uh, to address one question which I get uh, very often, and I'm sure uh, uh, you as, 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 uh, 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 as the financial analysts and stock market analysts look at. Uh, so contract manufacturers work at very, very low margins, right? Uh, whether it's, it's, it's my competitors or in, in, in this industry or in the pharma industry or in the electronics industry, we work with very, very low margins. And the reason we work with low margins is because we don't take on the risk in terms of marketing, branding, et cetera. Given the risk that we take on, uh, we believe, and, on, and, and I'm sure all of us do, uh, we believe we deserve the kind of margins that we are, we, we are making, uh, and we deserve the kind of ROEs that we are making. Uh, but there's no question that uh, uh, contract manufacturing is a very, very fine margin game. And as a result, any emphasis, uh, I mean, you can't emphasize enough uh, the need to be uh, uh, low cost, the need to be able to address costs across the entire manufacturing chain uh, to be able to ensure that you don't end up building fat into your system. So uh, this brings me to Hindustan Foods. Uh, so we believe that that we, we tick all these uh, requirements as far as uh, 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 as far as contract manufacturers are concerned, uh, we are large, uh, we are dependable, we are multi-locational, uh, we are uh, multi-product, uh, we manufacture uh, pest control products, we manufacture food, we also manufacture home care products. Uh, and in addition to that, we've been doing this uh, for nearly two decades, uh, which brings some credibility uh, as far as our relationships with uh, most of the companies are concerned. So, that ends my presentation, uh, Parin and Sanjeev. Uh, like uh, we like to call ourselves the brawn behind your brands. Uh, we are the muscle, uh, we are the back end. Uh, the brand owners are the creative people. They use their brains. Uh, we use the bronze. I mean, that's, that's really great. You answered the first few questions that I have already. It's a pretty comprehensive presentation. So that's really great. Thank you. So maybe, uh, you know, what we'll do is start with the, some of the macro and then we'll come to Hindustan foods also. Sure, sure. But, you know, let's just, you know, you talked about pharma, you talked about, you know, we've seen successful models in India and in pharma, chemicals, and now in electronics also. Uh, what is the key difference you think, uh, you know, what, you know, what are there different type of skills required for this, different type of risk levels and hence the return capabilities could be different for these industries? So, are you comparing contract manufacturing of pharma versus contract manufacturing of, of FMCG products? That's right. So, I'm just saying if, let's say, a contract manufacturer of uh, pharma may be able to get 30-40% return on capital or return on equity. Sure. You know, but are they taking more risks or what is happening and, you know, where can, what how is it different for FMCG? Sure. So, yeah. so, so FMCG contract manufacturing is, is uh, and, and, and I, I love the fact that you're comparing it to pharma contract manufacturing because, you know, uh, ever since uh, I got into this, this career and this business, uh, we've been looking at uh, pharmaceuticals as uh, basically the, the, the ideal uh, because FMCG contract manufacturing, especially in our country, uh, is lagging behind the pharmaceutical industry by nearly 10 to 15 years, right? Uh, the pharmaceutical companies have done a phenomenal job uh, in terms of uh, evolving along this, uh, uh, this life cycle of manufacturing. 
Part of the reason is the history that I spoke about uh, in terms of the tax arbitrages, etc., uh, which were not applicable to the pharma industry. So to answer your question in a, in a simple uh, way, uh, you're absolutely right that the FMCG industry needs to grow up to get to the same level as the pharma industry. There are certain basic differences uh, and I'll very quickly highlight those. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry is far more regulated uh, than the FMCG industry. Uh, and, and that's a part of evolution as well. Uh, considering that you put, let's say, uh, uh, let's say a topical ointment on your face or on your uh, on your uh, on your hands, uh, and you also put a cold cream on your face or an under eye cream on your on your under the eyes, it should technically require the same amount of regulatory uh, 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 regulatory supervision as the pharma industry. But we're not there, and I think uh, the regulatory framework is is beginning to change. Uh, pharma company, uh, the FMCG companies are now beginning to require a lot more, uh, let's say, uh, a lot more uh, emphasis uh, on uh, 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 on uh, um, GMP, GHK, meaning good manufacturing practices, good uh, hygiene practices. Uh, they are investing a lot in terms of machinery, systems, processes, etc. Uh, having, excuse me, having said that, I still believe we are at least five to seven years behind uh, the pharma industry. I think we will catch up very soon. I think the government is uh, is doing its bit in terms of increasing the regulatory uh, requirements for the FMCG industry as well. Uh, plus the industry themselves are investing a lot of money to scale up and to improve the infrastructure. Uh, so I think it's a matter of time that we'll get there. The electronics industry that you talked about uh, that's completely different. Uh, uh, however, I would not be surprised uh, that in terms of ROEs, uh, we will end up at very, very similar kind of uh, uh, ROEs as far as the electronics industry is concerned. Uh, uh, the pharma industry is above and beyond. Uh, I think that's the ideal that, that all of us should work to. Absolutely. Right. But also, in one of the things in pharma, is a lot of it is exports. And, you know, uh, I guess the arbitrage that you talk about cost arbitrage is very different level then and hence uh, so and you alluded to the fact that there are potential exports possible even in FMCG where are we on that are you seeing any inquiries at all so Sanjeev you have to understand that that pharmaceutical industry has started exporting because there's an entire ecosystem uh, which has developed over the last 10, 15 years, right? Uh, CIPLA, for instance, these, these are the guys who actually build the entire pharmaceutical ecosystem in the country. As far as FMCG is concerned, we do not have that ecosystem. Uh, we do not have the ecosystem in terms of packaging material availability. We do not have the ecosystem in terms of blow molding and injection molding as far as plastics is concerned. Uh, I, if I have to give you an example, you, you walk into a, a, a province in China and you say you want to launch. Uh, okay, actually, you know what? Let me give you another example. Uh, it is very, very uh, embarrassing as a country to say that uh, one and a half years ago when COVID first wave hit us and the demand for hand wash and hand sanitizers really shot up the roof, uh, the biggest problem for us in terms of ramping up our capacity was that we did not have enough pumps. Uh, you know, the pumps which go on the top of a hand wash bottle, uh, India does not manufacture enough. We actually imported from China. And uh, uh, since the demand across the world had increased, uh, there were, we were not able to supply, and we as in the entire industry, it's not only about Hindustan foods, uh, we were not able to supply enough uh, sanitizers because we didn't have flip top caps, and we were not able to supply enough uh, hand washers because we didn't have pumps. So uh, if you look at this ecosystem, right, uh, uh, that's going to have to be built before we can start looking at the scale at which China operates. Uh, if you have to, to start catering to a market like the US uh, or Europe, uh, you definitely need far more sophistication in terms of packaging material availability, raw material availability, etc. And I think uh, we are at least three to five years away from, from something like that. Sure. Uh, in terms of addressable market, you talked about a pretty large addressable market, but one of the things, uh, and you said that, you know, in terms of adoption of people, 
But when you look at the phase two that you talked about in the evolution of this industry, the phase two actually seemed like an anti, because you know you have you know anti contract manufacturing because the companies themselves set up their facilities. Given that all those tax tax arbitrages are running out, and now anyway it doesn't make sense. Are you even seeing opportunity of sale and lease back of those facilities? The company is saying, you know, you don't want to do any of these things, and why, why don't you take over? Are you seeing that as well? Absolutely, Sanjeev. I mean, you are absolutely right in 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 identifying that phase two uh, was a little anti-contract manufacturing, especially the direct tax advantages uh, uh, in the phase two uh, led to an uh, emphasis on setting up own manufacturing, uh, and and to that extent, the contract manufacturing industry. Uh, which is growing now could have grown earlier. Uh, so you're absolutely right that phase two was anti-contract manufacturing. You're right in again identifying that uh, yes, uh, larger FMCG companies are beginning to realize that maybe it's not best for their capital to be invested in manufacturing assets. Uh, what's happening is uh, the large brands in the country are now being challenged on multiple fronts, right? So you have uh, the organized trade, uh, which is the Reliance and the uh, uh, the Amazon, uh, the uh, uh, DMARs of the world, uh, which are becoming larger and are very soon or are already starting to extract their pound of flesh as far as the FMCG uh, value chain is concerned. You have the Amazons and the Flipkarts of the world, the e-commerce channels, who are also becoming, and uh, let's say, uh, a specialized e-commerce platform like Nike, uh, which are also becoming large and very soon will start flexing their muscles. Uh, you're going to see a lot of these guys come in with their private labels. You're going to see a lot of these D2C brands, uh, which are coming in as far as the FMCG industry is concerned. Uh, if you look at the FMCG industry today, uh, most of the big uh, categories of the products have two or three big brands. Right. So for a country like India, uh, you have you have a toothpaste brand which commands nearly 40 percent of the market share. Now, that is very, very counterintuitive. It's such a, a, a diverse market like India. How can one brand have 40 percent market share? Uh, does this mean that that, you know, out of the 1.6 billion people, uh, nearly uh, 600 million people have the same taste, have the same requirement in terms of their toothpaste, and that's counterintuitive. However, uh, what's happening now is tomorrow, if if Parin wants to launch a Meswak uh, uh, tasting uh, 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 toothpaste, or or Sanjeev decides that I want a coffee-based toothpaste, so that the first thing that I wake up in the morning, I brush my teeth with a coffee-flavored toothpaste, he can do that. And I, as a customer, if I want that coffee flavored uh, toothpaste, I can get it from an Amazon where Sanjeev will, will uh, uh, sell it. Uh, even if that Sanjeev is not able to get that product to the store next door to me. And I think uh, that's going to change in the next couple of years. Uh, so you're going to be able to see a lot more brands coming in. You're going to be able to see a lot of the traditional brands being challenged uh, in in very very different way, uh, uh, we 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 see this happening, uh, and as a result, we also see the traditional contra uh, the traditional FMCG companies beginning to say maybe uh, my capital is better spent in marketing, branding, and safeguarding my market share rather than investing it in a manufacturing facility, which somebody like Hindustan Foods can do it much cheaper. Uh, so you're absolutely right. I, I do see a larger share of contract manufacturing happening going ahead, even if the total market of manufacturing remains the same. Sure. sure. And you also talked about SSIs, you know, in the phase one. Are you, you know, of course, I don't know how many of them have survived so far, but are you seeing more consolidation now, given that, you know, uh, again, the requirements that you talked about now for a successful contract manufacturer look pretty onerous. And I don't think a small company can actually do that, right? So, are there a lot of acquisition opportunities, and are there or are people just closing down? What are you seeing there? Sure. So, Sanjeev, I think that's that's something which is playing across the entire country, right? Uh, I think demonetization, and then later the introduction of GST, as well as uh, uh, the overall compliance 
uh, the, uh, the, the fiscal as well as statutory compliance which is coming into the country is leading to a major formalization of the economy. Uh, and, and, and corollary of this formalization of the economy is uh, that small and medium scale enterprises uh, are finding it difficult uh, uh, in order to be competitive, in order to survive. And then, of course, in the last year uh, or the last year and a half because of COVID, uh, that's kind of uh, led a, a death blow uh, to a lot of small and medium scale enterprises. So I think you're going to be seeing a lot more formalization of the economy. Uh, you're definitely going to see a lot more of the bigger getting bigger while the smaller uh, either vanishing or becoming very, very small. Uh, and we are seeing this in our industry as well. Uh, because of the changes, because of the requirements, both in terms of corporate governance, in terms of the size of the projects, in terms of statutory compliances, uh, we are seeing that it's very, very difficult uh, for a small scale industry to be able to uh, measure up uh, and execute all of this. Extremely impossible uh, for a single owner mom and pop store uh, to be able to run a decentralized manufacturing operation with uh, 23 factories spread across 11 locations, right? Uh, and I think uh, that's one of the trends which you will see going ahead, uh, that large contract manufacturers will uh, emerge. Uh, and as a result, uh, they will definitely take some amount of market share away from uh, the small and medium scale uh, enterprises. Now, uh, whether they will close down or consolidate, uh, that's frankly, uh, I don't have an easy answer to that. It depends on the product. Uh, it depends on the location of the factory. Uh, some of them will probably have to shut down because they were subscale, uh, they were small, and they were engaged in a product uh, which cannot be scaled up in that particular factory. Some of them who have some technological advantage, who have some uh, intellectual property, uh, will probably get uh, bought out uh, in terms of an M&A. So I think that depends on uh, uh, the product category, the geography, a bunch of other factors. So we're seeing a mix of both. Uh, and we at Hindustan Food ourselves have uh, uh, been very, very aggressive in terms of our acquisition strategy. Uh, and uh, we, we, we definitely are a recipient uh, and a beneficiary of this trend. Sure. Let's come to economics. Uh, and, you know, you talked about margins, but I guess in the end, what matters is return. Right, because you know margin could be three percent, but if your ROEs and ROCs are way you know much better than cost of capital, I think it's a great business, right? So, where when you actually negotiate with the manufacturer, the the brand, what are you negotiating? Is it margin or you're you know negotiating a return? Sure. So, Sanjeev, uh, it differs, uh, and 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 I'm going to have to go back to the slide which I which I talked about, especially for HFL, and and, and that's pretty much the entire industry uh, works on a similar model. Uh, so, when we are setting up a dedicated facility, uh, when we are setting up a facility which has a clear long-term contract uh, with a minimum guarantee, uh, the negotiation revolves around uh, ROI and ROE expectations, right? Uh, everything else generally is a pass-through cost. Uh, and you end up negotiating on ROI and ROEs. Uh, and I specify an ROI and ROE is because uh, you have a built-in leverage uh, because it's a manufacturing uh, uh, operation and because the counterparties uh, that we are dealing with are extremely uh, credit worthy and credible, uh, we do tend to be very aggressive in terms of our debt as well. Uh, so we look at ROI and ROEs. When you're looking at a shared facility, uh, there, uh, frankly, the bargaining is uh, or the negotiating is more in terms of margins uh, because it's a temporary phenomena. The risk is much higher. And as a result, uh, we also insist on a, a larger margin as compared to, let's say, a, a, a dedicated factory. In case of private labeling, again, uh, you would end up negotiating on the basis of the margin uh, purely because the, the buyer or the customer at the other side is interested in a full product cost and he's generally not interested in the breakup of uh, the entire uh, uh, product constituents. Um, he's basically saying, can I buy a shaving cream from you for 20, 20 rupees with an MRP of 50 and can I sell it on Amazon at let's say 45? And that's, that's the kind of, of negotiation that would happen with a private labeling uh, customer. So I would say that uh, you're absolutely right that ROIs are what 
define a successful or actually ROEs are what define a successful versus an unsuccessful business. Uh, in case of our first model, uh, that's very clearly contracted and documented. In case of the second and third model, uh, there's a lot of operating leverage which comes into picture. And as a result, you could end up getting very, very good ROEs, uh, but you could also end up uh, making losses. The risk is much higher there. Sure. So when I look at your business and, you know, uh, you have like 80% currently from dedicated to suit kind of things and 20% rest. Are you saying that your ROEs are still much higher than cost of capital? But are you saying that if I this for this ROE is to grow, you will need to get instead of 80, 20, you will need to get 60, 40 or 70, 30, or you think that even with 80, 20, your ROEs can grow. So if you look at specifically, and, and, and again, I'm talking about Hindustan food specifically now, right? Uh, Hindustan food specifically, the ROE has to improve from here. Uh, one of the things that you would have noticed is that we have done some massive expansion in the last couple of years, and we continue to do uh, a substantial amount of expansion, uh, which we have plans for the next couple of years. So as a result, our ROEs continue to be depressed uh, because we have a lot of, uh, of, of uh, capital work in progress. We have a lot of investments which have not ramped up completely. Uh, we have a lot of investments uh, which are not stabilized in terms of their production. So if you look at Hindustan food, we do expect the ROEs to improve from here. Uh, uh, and if you look at the industry in general, uh, I would say that, yes, uh, uh, you would have to have a better mix uh, of shared manufacturing and private label uh, for the ROEs to improve. Uh, the way that would happen in case of Hindustan Foods is uh, we believe that uh, uh, this 80%, 85% of dedicated manufacturing will lead to some amount of increase in terms of the ROEs as more and more of our capacities are unlocked and ramped up. Uh, in the next three to four years, we expect a lot more of the shared manufacturing and private label manufacturing coming in, which should then give the added kicker as far as the ROE improvement is concerned for the next phase. Post that, uh, the way we are looking at it, uh, we are hoping that we'll be able to get into exports, we'll be able to start looking at uh, substituting the Chinese demand for FMCG products in the countries uh, like US and Europe. And I think that should be the next phase, uh, which would lead to an improvement in the ROEs as far as we are concerned. Sure. But, you know, I know, uh, you know, we are still at a very early stage and hence calling anything steady state is not the right thing. But would you say a steady state ROE of this business would be like 20, 25% or 25 to 30%? What is the right range to look at? So again, uh, I would have to break this up into three. Uh, uh, in case of a dedicated manufacturing, uh, are, are generally you would expect an ROE of between 18 to 22 uh, percent. You would then have some amount of a sweetener uh, towards the end of the contract because at the end of the contract, Sanjeev, uh, you you have a lot of real estate. I mean, uh, you do realize that that we are setting up factories across the country, buying large tracts of land, etc. Uh, and we believe uh, that that kicker will come in towards the end of the contract. So we believe that overall towards the life of the contract, we should be able to go closer towards 25 rather than closer towards 20. Uh, so we should be more towards 25 than towards 20. If you look at the real estate appreciation and the guaranteed ROE that our, our customers give us. In case of shared manufacturing, uh, it's very interesting. I mean, you could you could have an ROE which is which is uh, as high as fifty percent. Uh, you could have a, a situation where you're ma making losses uh, for a couple of years. Uh, unfortunately, Hindustan Foods has seen both the occasions. Uh, we we actually acquired the shoe manufacturing business uh, 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 in 2016-17, and our payback, uh, as far as that business is concerned, was less than a year. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have recently acquired uh, the beverage manufacturing facility in Mysuru. And in the last two years, because of COVID, uh, the beverage season, which is the summer season, has been completely washed out. And we've actually ended up making losses uh, in both of those years. So in case of shared manufacturing, the range would be like negative uh, to, let's say, a positive 50. Right. And similarly, in case of private labeling, uh, you could end up getting very, very sweet uh, return on uh, uh, equities. Right. 
So coming to growth, uh, you know, you've actually recently uh, on your on call earnings call, actually you said that you can, you will be able to double from 2000 crores to 4000 crores in a matter of three years and three to four years, whatever, you know, but, you know, and so far you have been KG about giving any kind of guidance, but despite the second wave being where it is, you actually came and gave, what makes you so confident that now that the things have changed, what, what has changed? Sanjeev, actually, we've been we've been quite upfront with our guidance, actually, right? Uh, so, in fact, uh, the last year we uh, I, I had mentioned earlier that we should be able to hit a thousand crores. Uh, uh, I mean, the year before last, and we did. Uh, and I actually apologized for it in our annual report, uh, as well as in my uh, uh, message there, uh, because uh, we should have been able to hit a thousand crores. Uh, for this financial year, we've given a guidance of two thousand crores, and and I think we should be able to hit that. Uh, for sure. Uh, one of the reasons why we are confident about giving the guidance is, uh, as you rightly pointed out, nearly 80% of our turnover comes from uh, the dedicated manufacturing uh, uh, model, uh, where we have very clear visibility of, of what we are going to be doing for the next five to seven years, right? Uh, and as a result, it's, it's, I mean, if we do not achieve the number that we have said, uh, there has to be very, very good reason for it. Uh, and I'm going to have, and I'm going to make it a practice uh, to inform my shareholders about what went wrong uh, in case we didn't achieve. So when we when we talked about a thousand crores uh, year before last, uh, one of our projects got delayed, and and that's why we ended up around 750 or 800. Uh, in last year, we did around 1400 crores. This year, we've given a guidance of around 2000 crores. I'm quite confident that we should be there. We've given. Uh, I would not call it a guidance, but we've set ourselves a goal of around 4,000 crores. Uh, and the reason I'm, I'm trying to differentiate between a guidance and a setting a goal is because uh, this, we, we do have a certain amount of pipeline, which makes us very, very confident of getting to that 4,000 crores. Uh, but we haven't been able to get to a definitive level uh, where I can inform uh, the shareholders about uh, what this uh, uh, 4,000 is going to constitute of. Uh, the, the extra 2000 from uh, the existing 2000. But uh, we are quite confident that uh, we, we talked about it, right? If the if the if the uh, total addressable market for contract manufacturing is even at the least 25,000 crores, uh, getting to 4000 crores is a drop in the ocean. Uh, and this does not take into consideration that the market has to grow at at least eight to 10 percent per year. Uh, so even if we don't uh, get market share from other contract manufacturers if we are not able to get wallet share uh, from our other principles, etc. Just the consumption story of India should get us a growth of eight to ten percent uh, per year. Uh, so that's that's what is giving us the confidence right now. Uh, in addition to that, Sanjeev, we've recently uh, 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 announced a foray into health and wellness sector. Uh, I'm I'm quite uh, bullish about that, especially in the last two years when all of us have uh, uh, popped vitamin C and zinc tablets and had uh, tons of chavanprash to build up our immunity. Uh, I think uh, the health and wellness sector in India is going to grow tremendously. And uh, I think that we should be able to offer a similar kind of a solution uh, that we are doing for FMCG uh, for the health and wellness as well. Uh, and that should make my uh, make my company's uh, addressable market even larger than the twenty five thousand crores that we talked about. Sure, but uh, you know I'll come back to the funding part of it. But just one thing, you know, what is the key risk to this? You know, and what just what keeps you awake? You know, what what can go wrong? Can something go wrong with a big brand? What 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 are the risks in this business? Sure, Sanjeev. I think so. The biggest risk is is is. We are manufacturing, right? So the biggest risk is execution. Uh, frankly, I'm, I'm sitting at a factory uh, where behind me, uh, we have nearly a thousand people working, right? Uh, we are manufacturing uh, uh, close to, uh, I would say around 300, 300 tons per day of product. Uh, if there is any kind of a human error, if there's any kind of a quality issue, if there is any kind of an IR issue, if there's any kind of a safety issue, uh, that is what nightmares are made of. Uh, I, like I said earlier in my presentation, uh, the episode in the Winstron factory for Apple is, is, is a nightmare. That's the biggest risk that we as manufacturers carry. Because what's going to happen is this. If, 
I am sitting at a factory uh, which nobody has heard about, but the brands which are being manufactured behind me are brands which all of you and all of your listeners are familiar with. If something goes wrong, if there's a manufacturing defect, what's going to happen is the brand value of my customer is at risk. You're going to look at a product and you're not going to look behind to find out who manufactured it, but you're going to say that XYZ brand is got a problem and you're never going to use that again. So as a result, it's my fiduciary duty towards the customer uh, to ensure that he does not face a manufacturing issue, that he does not face an issue because of social compliances at my factory. He does not face an issue or uh, 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 adverse reaction on social media, on, on his brand value, etc., because of some screw up done at, at our factory. And I think that's what's uh, the biggest risk. Uh, we have to execute. Uh, we have to get the right product out. We have to get it at the right time and we have to get it at the right place and the right price. Uh, that is the biggest risk, if I may say so. Sure. So, I know we are running out of time, so but last two questions at least. Uh, so one is on the funding side. So if you need to go to 4,000 crores, uh, again, in the call it was said that most of it can be done with uh, internal approvals and so on. Just wanted to you know, confirm that. Sure. Point. So I'll, I'll just reiterate what I've said in my in my communications to my shareholders as well as uh, the investor community. Uh, the business of contract manufacturing uh, by by definition is uh, uh, is it generates cash, right? Uh, because we don't invest in working capital. We don't invest, uh, especially in case of the dedicated manufacturing facilities. Uh, uh, we don't invest. Uh, we don't have to invest. Uh, uh, in working capital, so which uh, which means that if the factory is up and running, it will hopefully start contributing cash uh, within three to six months. Given that, uh, uh, it's very easy for us to take those cash flows and invest it for the growth. Uh, and as a result, uh, we generally don't require access to outside funding. However, uh, because we've been very aggressive in terms of M and uh, and, and obviously, when you when you look at a project, a greenfield or a brownfield project versus an acquisition, the timing of the cash flow is very, very different. Uh, in case of an acquisition, you need to pay the money up front. In case of a project, uh, you need to spend the same amount of money spread over a year, year and a half. Uh, so the only time we resort to uh, 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 raising of uh, money or funding is if we are going in for a big ticket acquisition. Right. If it's if it's normal growth capex, uh, we are very confident that we should be able to fund it uh, through ourselves. Uh, and but that's the reason I have confidently stated that for the 4000 crores, we don't see ourselves uh, going uh, to look at uh, uh, any kind of fundraise. Uh, however, if there is uh, uh, any acquisition opportunity which comes our way, uh, which we believe is is uh, uh, very interesting, uh, we will we we might have to to look at uh, raising money. Right, but. Is there a limit on terms of what size acquisition that you want to do in terms of risk from a risk perspective? Oh, it's, uh, actually, Sanjeev, we have a very, very clear capital allocation uh, uh, policy. Uh, the board has, has laid it out very clearly. If it's a dedicated facility, uh, and even if it's an acquisition for, uh, like you earlier said, sale and lease back uh, of a dedicated facility, uh, the sky's the limit. Uh, we are happy to take on uh, uh, any kind of a project, any kind of an outlay uh, for that kind of a situation. Uh, because we believe that if we have a long-term contract, the risk is very, very minimal as far as uh, that kind of setup is concerned. However, in case of shared manufacturing, uh, the, the board is uh, right now given us the clear uh, policy that we should not look at acquisitions which are greater than around 30 odd crores, uh, just in terms of pure uh, risk mitigation. Uh, so yes, uh, we have very, very clear capital allocation policies uh, in terms of what kind of acquisitions or for that matter, the same uh, capital allocation policy is uh, applicable even for greenfield and brownfield investments. We will not invest more than 30 crores, even if it's a greenfield project for a shared facility. Sure. The last question uh, is a more, you know, in, in your uh, website, you, you know, when you look at your bio, it says promoter of vanity case. There's still a company called Vanity. How is it different from Hindustan Food? Are there any so, other businesses? It, it has it has no other businesses actually, Sanjeev. Uh, 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 Vanity Case has been doing contract manufacturing for more than two decades. 
uh, Hindustan Foods was actually uh, came into the uh, uh, the vanity case fold in 2012-13. Hindustan Foods was originally owned by the Dempo family of Goa. It's part of the Dempo group. Mr. Srinivas Dempo uh, continues to be the chairman of our uh, uh, of our board. Uh, and we uh, uh, joined hands in 2012-13. And since then, uh, we have integrated all our uh, old businesses into Vanity Case, uh, into Hindustan Foods, and all new projects have come into Hindustan Foods. So to give you an idea, uh, if, if we achieve 2,000 crores of turnover in this year, less than 10% of that will be in entities other than Hindustan Foods. And again, uh, that's something that I have gone on record with. Uh, I, have, I have promised to the shareholders that in the next couple of years, uh, we will integrate even that 10% into Hindustan Foods. So Vanity Case and Hindustan Foods uh, will be uh, one, and uh, we will be doing only contract manufacturing of uh, FMCG products. Sure. Sorry, Parin, I didn't you know, leave any questions for time for you. But Samit, thank you. And anything else that you want to kind of, you know, we've talked, there are quite a you know, I could go on for another hour, but if there is anything that you have that you want to kind of just talk about that we've missed. No, so Sanjeev, it's, it's, I, I think, I think it's, it's very interesting. You know, when you, when you first uh, floated this idea of, of, of talking on, on, on your program and you sent me a few uh, uh, representative talks, I frankly was, was uh, in awe of the people who've spoken before me. Uh, obviously they're very eloquent and, and, and they're very knowledgeable. Uh, my industry is a little, uh, what shall I say, uh, uh, back of the beyond. It's a B2B business. Uh, it's, a, it's a business which is not very glamorous. I hope that I've been able to shed some light on it. Uh, and in terms of, uh, just in terms of the intellectual level of the people that, that have spoken to you before that, uh, I hope at least uh, I've been able to measure up a little bit in your eyes uh, in trying to give you an idea of how the FMCG contract manufacturing space works. So, you know, Sami, you are being very, very modest. I think this was an excellent presentation. And I, I think, as I said, we can go on for one more hour. So, Thank you, uh, Sanjeev. You're being you. kind. Thank you so much. All right. Pleasure. Uh, thank Parin, thank you so much. We'll catch up soon, sir. Absolutely. Bye. See you then. Bye. Thank you.